Greetings, this is Professor Griff of Public Enemy. Welcome to the Oculus Inc. The Oculus, they are the ultra secret society. They are the ones that manipulate and control your perception. They're actually the gatekeepers of your perception. The Oculus are the ones that actually write the prescription. They are the ones to determine who and why you see what you're actually seeing through signs and symbols. These signs and symbols, we see them every single day. Your banks, your fast food stores, energy companies, gas stations, car companies, sports teams, all of them have signs and symbols that they use in such a way where they speak a language to one another. These are the things that the Oculus controls. The Oculus, Oculus Inc. Music, R and B, hip hop, pop, I still get reggae, EDM, indie, old school, side, side. <laughs> Check it. and sports talk. Right here, WorldStarHitRadio.com. All right, peace, 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 peace. I, of course, yes, this is Professor Griff. The name of the show is Serious Minds with your host, Professor Griff, right here on world star hit radio i'm gonna give you a minute some time to adjust your thinking your vibration your spirit so you can join us all right okay tonight we got a very interesting show we're going to be talking about the state of hip-hop we're going to talk about where it was where it is and our collective thought on where it's headed and where it's going to end up by the time we recognize what's going on and decide to actually do something about it. All right, if you're not familiar with who I am, which you should already know, I'm the Minister of Information for Public Enemy. A lot of people can't make the connection. They saw Flavor doing this thing on Flavor of Love and sitcoms and Chuck D on Fox and ESPN and Air America and all, and they just can't make the connection. Yeah, we're all from a group called Public Enemy, um, kind of put our thing together back in the 70s, right on through the 80s, um, I departed early, late 80s, early 90s. I we got back. Well, I got back with the group mid to late 90s, and we've been doing our thing ever since. Since then, we've been um, inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So um, I guess that would be etched in stone. All right, but anyway, I want to talk about the state of hip hop. But before I do that, there's a few announcements I have to get out of the way. Let me give everybody the number real quick. The number to call if you have any questions, any comments, 404-751-5062, all right? That's 404-751-5062. All right, just give me a call. Right now, if you're watching this, you should be hitting people up like, yo, Griff is on. Let me um let me uh let me log on and check them out. You should be calling a friend right now. Alright, hitting them up, letting them know that we on um serious minds here on World Star Hit Radio. Go to www.worldstarhitradio.com, click on and watch it live. Alright, click on and watch it live. Alright. Alright. All right, so we're talking about the state of hip hop. Um, we're going to dive into that subject right after these messages, but we're gonna be talking about the state of hip hop and I'm gonna be coming from this book right here, which I'm gonna introduce in a minute. Last week I gave some uh, resource information out and I wanted to focus at least on one book that you should try to uh, buy, download, get the PDF or whatever you have to do to get it but last week we came out of Stephen Jacobson's book Mind Control in America we talked about um, Dr. Amos Wilson's body of work not just one of his books but his body of work alright so we're going to be talking about that stuff um, um, as we go over this subject we're going to refer back to those particular books but in the meantime in between time the show tonight is brought to you by, of course, Lion Imagery. It's Lion Images, my man Solo. 
All right, so just look him up on Instagram, on IG, Lion Images. Look him up on Facebook. Um, and right now he's developing his YouTube channel. Of course, Colin El Akin with the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. All right, so look him up on IG at the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. All right, it's Black History 101. Um, of course, my man Vance Vex at Solar Sound Studio. That's Vance Vex at Solar Sound Studio right here in the ATL. Um, and as always, um, um, I get support from the Debbie Tribe Wellness. That's my wife's company. Um, and her beautiful name is Soleil, the Debbie Tribe uh, Wellness. And of course, um, my daughter with the Exotic Mixtures, Exotic Naturals, all right? Y'all check out Kiki, Exotic Mixtures on IG. Go to, um, go to Facebook, Exotic Mixtures, um, Exotic Naturals. And I'm sure you could catch her. I'm not sure if she has a YouTube channel. I'm not sure she should have one. But um, check her out on Facebook and IG. That's Exotic Mixtures. Um, so all those beautiful people send their energy and put their nickels and dimes together and lend their support to make sure this show, Serious Minds on World Star Hit Radio, is successful. Alright, and of course, one last one is Yoga Skills Studio. Right there on the west end of the ATL where my wife teaches her yoga class. Alright, so now that we got the business out of the way, one last thing. Um, me and my man Terminator X got together and we're actually going to do a revolutionary look at the history of hip-hop. Alright, that's June 23rd at 4 o'clock. June 23rd at 4 o'clock. That's Saturday, June 23rd at 4 o'clock at Moods, pardon me, at Soul Village right next door to Moods Music. That's 1129 Euclid Avenue. Are in Atlanta, Georgia. Get your tickets now. Go to www.paypal.me forward slash Professor Griff Corporation. Or you can just call me at 678-557-2919. All right. So let's dive into this subject. All right. The state, the state of hip hop. Now, um, I guess y'all already know that, um, the state of hip hop is in a hell of a poor state. It's in a hell of a confused state. Um, whatever the state is in, nonetheless, it's our music, our creation. And we should be the ones, not only at the helm of it, running it, understanding it, um, guiding it, nurturing it, uh, developing it, to pass it on to the generations behind us. But, but obviously, we're not. Banksters and gangsters, all right. Um, corporate lawyers and attorneys, thieves, liars, cutthroats, pimps, um, are, ta are taking hip hop off course to make hip hop into a money making machine that they've turned it into. So we're gonna we're gonna deal with some of the beautiful things about hip hop tonight, all right. And we're gonna deal with some of the ugly things about hip hop and. One of the uh, areas of hip-hop, the four fundamental areas of hip-hop, and that's rapping. And there is a difference. We're going to talk about that in a second. Tonight, we're coming from a body of work that I put together. But we're coming from um, this book along with my book, The Psychological Call for War on Hip-Hop. But we're coming from this book, Chuck D. Presents This Day in Rap and Hip-Hop History. All right? Chuck D.'s book presents This Day in Rap and Hip-Hop history. So some of the things I'm going to talk about and some of the artists have actually lent their energy to this particular um, conversation through blogs, through articles, through um, their vlogs, through what they've been saying at lectures, to books they have written, um, and just um, a number of different ways that they've lent their energy and their resources to this particular um, subject. All right. I know you're digging a shirt with the matching hat. Alright. Um, yeah, this brother kind of definitely had put me on to his his uh his gear. Because all of his gear got a, a beautiful message to it. And I said, yeah, let's make it happen, bro. Shoot. So I'm willing to make it happen. He's willing to make it happen. So we here making it happen together. Alright. So let me go to uh I'm supposed to be getting a few messages, a few people want me to read a few things, alright, 
I'm taking this first quote off of Ed King's work. Um, and he sends me kind of his um, newsletter every single week. And one of the things that he sent me, which I found was very interesting, he says, in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. So if you find people that are ignorant, they choose to be ignorant. There's a whole lot of information out here. No one, all right, no one should be ignorant. It's just too much information out here for anyone to be ignorant, all right? It says, in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act, all right? In the time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this particular subject, state of hip hop, and we're going to tie it into what's going on with hip hop artists today and just uh, entertainers in general. What's going on with entertainers in general? All right, so we're going to dive, we're going to dive into this thing. All right, I am looking for information I'm supposed to pass on to you. We'll find it in a minute. All right, but anyway, since the outstart of hip hop, hip hop comes from a long lineage and a long line of great black people in all genres of music. The vast majority of the genres of music that were created for us as a people to use as a vehicle to carry our culture on and through most of those genres of music have been taken over by the culture bandits. And you can you can study that uh, book by Dale Jones, Culture Bandits. All right. So I'm going to give you a brief history of those genres of music, and then we're going to dive into hip hop. And we're going to get into the state of hip hop. Um, from the early on, from uh, Africa. All right. There have been those genres of music, which are not even in some cases and in most cases uh, identifiable. So when you start talking about Africa and you start talking about the griots and you start talking about the storytellers and you start talking about those brothers and sisters in the community and in the village that was responsible for passing on the information. All right. There was a beautiful thing that was happening at that particular time and it was called the oral tradition. All right, the oral tradition. And the oral tradition was a beautiful thing simply because the oral tradition spoke to the fact that the information had to be passed on from father to son, from mother to daughter. All right? So let's understand that particular dynamic because that's the birth of the MC. We'll talk about that um, in one second. So now um, we go to gospel. And all gospel is is God's spell. All right. Now I'm not talking about no witchcraft, but even if I am, there's absolutely nothing wrong with witchcraft. I know y'all looking at me like, what do you mean there's nothing wrong with witchcraft? Those sacred sciences that black people created to pass out information on through, uh, white religious people came along and demonized those particular concepts and ended up calling those people that did those particular things and studied those particular practices as witches. All right, definitely not a bad um, name. So the gospel, the whether it's the, the preaching and the oral tradition that they practice inside of the uh, of the church, especially if it's a good black Christian church, man, you will hear it. You'll hear the old tradition on Sunday morning. So with the urban blues, with the rhythm and blues, with the jazz and all the different subgenres of jazz, swing, bebop, hard bop, cool jazz, free jazz, soul jazz, um, rhythm and blue, which y'all call R&B, right? which is rhythm and blues, not as Chuck D says, not Reagan and Bush. So when we start talking about all the rhythm and blues, that have came along, too numerous to mention. I'm just going over the genres, all right? When we gave birth to the whole idea of soul music, doing what would naturally came to us, we gave birth to um, companies um, like Stax and Motown and Philadelphia International, all right? Even when we, when we went out to protest, 
we gave birth to those freedom songs that they used in the civil rights movement. So at that particular time now, uh, there was an artist I talked about last time I was here at World Star Hit Radio. His name was Robert Johnson. He gave birth all right, to uh, rock and roll. Uh, along with Chuck Berry and other people, we, we understood what the Mamba and, um, and different aspects of integrating uh, um, integrating and the African influence, inter, uh, influencing other people, and we're mixing cultures and subcultures uh, together. But even when the civil rights era, there were theme songs that carried the civil rights. Even when we protest in the street in the turbulent 60s, there were, um, there were uh, songs that spoke to what was going on at the time. As I said, and I often say, during the turbulent 60s, James Brown came up with an anthem that was critical. Sly and Family Stone came up with an anthem, Everyday People, that was critical. Um, Sly and Family Stone made a song called Don't Call Me Whitey, Nigga. Don't Call Me Nigga, Whitey. James Brown came up with a song, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Uh, I think Edward Starr did War. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. So, moving right along to the other genres of music. Go-Go uh, and and rock and then later on disco all right right in the middle of the disco era it was subverted by a genre of music which included all the other genres of music that I just mentioned all right um and a few more that I didn't mention it was called hip-hop all right it was called hip-hop high infinite power healing our people, as Minister Server would say. Alright? Hip-hop acted like a giant barrel of gumbo, man. And all the other genres of music was put in and we stirred it up and we came up with this beautiful, beautiful concept. So much so, we opened the doors of hip-hop and everyone was allowed to come in. Alright? So, um, even with hip-hop now, hip-hop has its different regions. We gave birth to different MCs, and this is what Chuck D talks about in his book. Chuck D presents this day in rap and in hip hop history. All right, so going on, uh, uh, Chuck D going over the different times and the different eras uh, in hip hop. Um, let me see where does he start out? 1980, 73 to 83. All right, so from 73 to 83 was the incubation period for hip hop. Cool Herc, uh, uh, right on set with Av up in the Bronx, uh, and Cool Herc and other people, Africa Bambada, which came uh, after Cool Herc. Um, there was a lot of, not a lot of people, there's a few people that's instrumental in kicking this thing off, man. Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, Sugar Hill Gang, Curtis Blow, and this is a basic history of, 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 of hip hop. You see, when you get older cats like myself and other cats that are in the industry that try to talk to the young cats today. This, right now, what I'm giving you is the history of hip-hop that you should know. Alright? And there's nothing wrong with picking up the book. It's a very beautiful book written in a very critical and, and uh, simplistic kind of way. Alright? Um, this is the history that the older generation is trying to pass down to the younger generation that you should know the history of hip-hop. So when you go to do the interviews, all right, now that you've so-called made it in the quote-unquote industry, you'll know what you're talking about. you got to get the history, all right? This is why myself and Terminator X decided to get together to do the history of hip-hop. So the young cast that's in hip-hop today and in music in general can understand the uh, the, uh, the apparatus and the... And the uh, and the, and the vehicle that gave birth to what you're doing today. So we can pay um, respect and pay homage back. And then ultimately pay it forward. Hip-hop. High infinite power healing our people. The four fundamental elements of hip-hop. See, I should ask y'all that. And then wait on your phone call to call me for somebody to give me the four elements. Alright? But I'd probably be waiting for a, a long time. Alright? The phone number here is 404-751-5062. But the four fundamental elements of hip hop are DJing, MCing, breaking, and graffiti. All right, which they've added an element. 
to synthesize the four fundamental elements, which is knowledge of self. All right? What you're getting today is not the four fundamental elements of hip-hop. To give it that etherical balance. Hold on one second. Peace. This is Professor Grip on Serious Minds at World Star Hit Radio. May I help you? Hello? Hello? Yes. Hi. How are you? Who am I speaking with? I'm doing well. My name is Asia, and I'm calling from Cleveland, but I thought I was just calling in to listen to a show. I didn't think you were going to answer the phone. Nah, you got to go to www.worldstarhitradio.com and listen to the show. Okay, got you. Thank uh, you. All right. Cool. Yeah. Peace. Yeah. All right. So you're just tuning in on Facebook. We've already started. Um, we're diving in to the uh, we're diving in to the concept of the four fundamental elements of hip hop: MC and DJ and graffiti and breaking. And we was just about to get into the fact that there is a difference between rap and hip hop. There is a difference between rap and hip hop. All right. So let's understand that. So if hip hop is high infinite power healing our people, and hip hop, um, hip hop is uh, the umbrella. Let's say hip hop is the umbrella. So if hip hop is the umbrella, then the four fundamental elements of hip hop would fall up under hip hop. The MC, which is rapping, the DJing, graffiti, uh, breaking pop locking and that kind of thing and then knowledge itself all right okay so we're talking about the state of hip-hop here at world star hit radio all right on my show serious minds all right so if we take in hip-hop and we're using hip-hop as the, the vehicle all right so we can use hip-hop as the vehicle and, and as we as we use hip-hop as the vehicle some people have taken aspects of hip hop. Some people have just taken DJing and ran with it. And people think that's all it is. Some people have taken graffiti, ran with it, and think that's all it is. Some people have taken MCing, uh, which today they don't even call themselves MCs, they call themselves rappers. They've taken it and ran with it. Alright? So we have to understand the particular dynamic. Of what we're dealing with all right hold on so if you're on um if you're on facebook i'm going to try to uh hold on one second if you're on facebook um if the connection is not clear you got to go to www.worldstarhitradio.com all right art is not necessarily musical but when we put it on display it's subject to the judgment and the inter interpretation of both um, appreciative and unappreciative audience and the nature of that world uh, for both artsy people music and other things um, you have to have tough skin so to speak to pass that particular test and it's a hell of a thing even those unfamiliar with the genre can recognize that rap and hip-hop are not the way that it used to be a pre-2005 hip-hop or rap hit can easily be distinguished from a track released in the past decade. And artists who have gotten into the game within the last 10 years bear little similarity to what was the norm for the 90s era rappers. Would you agree? Alright. There's a big difference. Uh, 90s era rappers they did a lot of good and did a lot of damage to hip hop. The 80s, with the conscious era of hip hop ushering itself in and then getting usurped by gangster rap, which left, uh, which left the genre punch drunk, so to speak. Other people started influencing hip hop and it turned into a lot of sub-genres. A term referenced by, oh pardon me, it says um, early hip-hop music has a distinguished tone and relatively constant theme of hood politics. A term referenced by Nas in his 2002 hit 
one mic. Meanwhile, the artists themselves main, sh maintained strict gangster personas. Most of the genre's biggest names, such as Notorious B.I.G. and Jay-Z, were known drug dealers, and many were convicted criminals. That was this. That was the 90s. They carried that over into, and some never made it. Some never made it. All right. Um, a lot fell by the wayside, which we're going to talk about. Hopefully in a few weeks with a speech from Arrested Development. And I got a lawyer that I'm interviewing and a few other people that I'm interviewing right here at World Star Hit Radio on Serious Minds. All right. So um, we have to understand. So now, this is a very critical thing I wanted to talk about. Now I wanted to talk about, I already talked about May Brussels. I came from page 52 of my book, The Psychological Covert War on Hip Hop. But... I didn't want to go back over, I was going to do a recap of last week, but I said no, let me step the game up. I'm sure that you have heard, most have not read, right, about the secret meeting that changed rap and destroyed a generation, alright? I'm going to attempt to go over aspects of that secret meeting that I have here. I'm going to attempt to go over aspects of that particular meeting and point out a few things, and then we're going to dive into some other things. All right, once again, this is Professor Griff. The show is Serious Minds here on World Star Hit Radio. Go to www.worldstarhitradio.com and you can watch the show from there. And of course, um, you're live streaming this, all right? If you miss it, you can catch it on my YouTube channel that's, up, that's Serious Minds. You can go to Serious Minds, my YouTube channel. The secret meeting that changed rap. I'm gonna, I'm not gonna start at the tippy tippy top there, but no one understand. I talked about social engineering um, and mind control in hip hop last week. Go back to Serious Minds and go to the archives and see the show that I did last week, right here. But between the late '80s and the early '90s, um, I was what you may, what you may call a decision maker. One of the more established company with established company in the music industry. I came from Europe in the early 80s and quickly established myself in the business. And the industry was the industry was different back then. Science, technology, and media weren't um, accessible to the people like it is today. The industry had more control over the public and had the means of influence um, to influence them any any way it wanted to. Now that should that speaks volumes right there. You didn't necessarily have social media, all right? You didn't. You couldn't instantly put a song out uh, across the globe that, like you could do today. It had to go through its proper channels. Had to go to the uh, to the record label, and they gave you a release date. Now people are releasing them their songs and their albums and their projects on their own whenever they want to. All right. This may explain why in early 1991 I was invited to attend a closed door meeting with a small group of music business insiders to discuss rap music. Let me see. Alright, Facebook Live is having me start this over. Alright, let's put a subject in there. Professor Griff. This is critical. This technology is something else. Sometimes it's a blessing. Um, and sometimes it's a curse. Right now, more of a curse than a blessing. <laughs> All right, we're gonna start it again. Start the live video, and it's trying to stop. But anyway, let's finish this. Um, where was I at? Our casual chatter, uh, no, based on their behavior, oh, I wasn't there, let me go back, I don't want to, I want you to get the story now, beyond a circle. It says, um, oh, it says, this meeting was held at a private residence on the outskirts of Los Angeles. I remember about 20 to 30 people being here, um, being there, most of them familiar faces. So this is someone that was there that recognized the familiar faces that was there at this particular um this particular meeting 
Speaking to those I knew, we joked about the theme of the meeting, and many of us did not care about rap music and failed to see the purpose of being invited to a private gathering to discuss the, its future. Among the attendees was a, in the small group was unfamiliar faces who stayed to themselves and made no attempt to socialize beyond their independent or the individual circle. Right, I'm going to skip over some of this. So it says, based on their behavior um, and formal appearance, they didn't seem to be in our industry. Our casual chatter was interrupted when there was, um, they were asked to sign a confidentiality agreement preventing us from publicly discussing the information presented during this meeting. Needless to say, this intrigued and in some cases disturbed many of us. The agreement was only a page long but very clear on the, on the matter and the consequences which stated that violating the terms uh, would result in job termination. They had a private secret meeting to ask to sign a confidentiality agreement that you disclose what's being discussed at this particular meeting. Um, they would terminate you. I'm setting the stage now. Alright. Let's go back to this. The agreement was only a page long, but it was a clear matter of consequences, blah, 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 blah. It says we asked several people what this meeting was about and the reason for such secrecy, but couldn't find anyone who had any answers for us. A few people refused to sign, and no one stopped them. They left. It was escorted out. Alright. Yeah. I guess that's the <laughs> I guess that's the way it works in the music industry. You ask to sign a confidentiality agreement, you refuse to sign, and these people escorted these individuals out. Alright. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. It said I was uh I was tempted to follow. But curiosity got the best of me, and a man who was a part of this unfamiliar group collect, collected the agreements from us. All right. Quickly after the meeting began, one of our industry colleagues, who shall remain anonymous, pardon me, remain nameless, like everyone else, thanked us for attending the meeting, and he then gave the floor to a man who only introduced himself by the first name and gave no further details about his personal background. I think he was the owner of the residence, but it was never confirmed. He briefly praised all of us uh, for the success we've achieved in our industry, congratulating us for being selected as a small group uh, of decision makers. At this point, I began to feel slightly uncomfortable at the strangeness of the gathering. Alright, this is where it gets thick. Alright, if you're just tuning in, this is Professor Griff on World Star Hit Radio. My show is Serious Minds. All right? It's about to get crazy in here. The phone number is 404-751-5062. 404-751-5062. All right? The subject quickly changed as the speaker went on to tell us that the respective companies were represented uh, and had interested and invested in a very profitable industry which could become more and even more rewarding for our activity active involvements. He explained that one of the companies we worked for had invested millions of dollars into the building of private owned prisons and that our position of influence in the music industry would actually impact the profitability, profitability of these investments. I guess they dropped that on them real quick. So he's at a private meeting on the outskirts of LA. Then they're made to sign confidentiality agreements. Not only that, some people refused and got escorted out. At that particular moment, they dropped a bombshell on them and they was told that the certain companies that are hooked up and got together had invested millions of dollars into private prisons. The plot thickens. Ha! Huh. It says we were told that these prisons were built by privately owned companies who would receive funding from the government based on the number of inmates. The more inmates, the more money the government would pay those prisons, these prisons. It was also made clear to us that since the prisons were privately owned, 
as they as they became they become publicly traded, we'd be able to buy shares in these particular prisons. Most of us were taken aback by this. Again, a couple of people asked, what, what does this have to do with us? At this particular point, my industry colleague who had first opened opened the meeting, took the floor, and again answered our questions. He told us that since our employees had become silent investors into these private prisons, this private prison business, it was now in their interest to make sure that these prisons remained filled. All right? Peace, Tori. What's good, Wayne? Um, now, let's go on. He assured us that this would be a great situation for us because rap music was becoming an increasingly profitable market for our companies. As and as employee and, and as employees, we also be able to buy personal stock in these prisons. Immediately, silence came over the room. He said, "You can hear a pin drop." All right, you could be, you can hear a pin drop. He says, "I remember looking around to make sure I wasn't dreaming, and saw half of the people." with uh, dropped jaws. My days was interrupted by someone shouting, um, is this a fucking joke? At that point, things became chaotic. Two of the men who were a part of this unfamiliar group grabbed the man who shouted out and attempted to, to remove him from the house. A few of us jumped up, myself included, and tried to intervene. One of the men pulled out a gun and all of us backed off. They separated us from the crowd and all four of us was escorted outside. My industry colleague who had opened the meeting earlier hurried, hurried out to, uh, to meet us and reminded us that we had signed an, a confidentiality agreement and would suffer the consequences of speaking about this publicly or even with those who attended the meeting. I asked him why was he involved in something uh, this corrupt and he replied it was bigger than music, the music business and nothing we want to challenge without risking consequences. We all protested, and and as he walked back into the house, uh, I remember a word, word for word, what was the last thing he said to us? It was uh, out of out of as out of my hands now. Remember, you signed an agreement, and then closed the door behind him. The men rushed us to our cars and actually watched until we drove off. Now I am reading. In case you're coming on late, I am reading the secret meeting that changed rap music. The secret meeting that changed rap music and destroyed a generation. Now, if you're anywhere near a computer, you can Google that. The secret meeting that changed rap, and you can pull up the document yourself. All right? I'm going on to say that, now this is not me saying this. I'm, I'm reading this anonymous letter that was put out several years ago. Now, mind you, this took place in 1991. All right, roll your, map, your mind back to that time frame. 1991 all right roll your mind back to what songs was out what songs were coming out what artists were popular at that particular time all right so now he says a million things were going through my mind as i drove away and i eventually decided to pull over and park on a side street in order to collect my thoughts i replied i re replayed everything in my mind repeatedly and it all seemed very surreal to me. I was angry with myself for not have taken a more active role in questioning what had been presented to us. I'd like to believe the shock of it all, but it was, pardon me, it was suspended. My uh, my better nature. Yeah, so better, it's better judgment, it's better nature said to him, let me just chill out. Dre, peace, what's good? Peace, queen. Soleil, how you doing? Alright. Of course y'all know y'all can go to www dot world star hit radio and you can watch this broadcast all right i just put it on youtube i mean uh facebook live to um get y'all familiar with what the broadcasting because it's going to take several weeks to get people to log on carl glover what's good um to world star that's world star hit radio all right let me go on he said i thought about contacting three three others who were kicked out of the house but i didn't remember their names and i thought uh, I thought that tracking them down would probably bring, bring more unwanted attention. I considered speaking out publicly at the risk of losing my job, but I realized I probably would be jeopardizing more than a job, and I wasn't willing to risk anything happening to my family. 
1991. Where were you in 1991? What was you doing? All right. Now, mind you, this meeting happened in 1991. So everything happening from 1991 through 1990, pardon me, 2000, we have to take special care and paying attention to the songs and the albums that was released during that particular period. All right. Uh, I thought about those men with guns, those men with guns, and wondered who they were. I had been told that this was bigger than the music industry, and all I could do was let my imagination run free. All right? There were no answers and no one to talk to. I tried to do a little bit of research on the prisons, the private prisons, but, uh, but didn't uncover anything about the music industry's involvement of establishing and investing in the private prisons. All right? Just so you'll know, you look up a company called the CCA. All right? The CCA. There were no answers and no one to talk to. I tried to do a little research about private prisons and nothing came up. However, the information I did find confirmed how dangerous this private prison business really was. Days turned into weeks and weeks turned into months. Eventually, I was as if the meeting had never taken place. It all seemed surreal. I became more reclusive and stopped going to any industry events unless professionally obligated to do so. On two occasions, I find myself attending the same function as my former colleagues, and both times our eyes met, but nothing more than, than an exchange happened. I never discussed anything from the meeting. I dared not speak out publicly. And if you have ever read my book, which I'm going to go over some things next week, um, if I get a chance to uh, interview the lawyer and I get a chance to, uh, to interview speech from Arrested Development, I'm going to go over some of these things in my book when it talks about the secret covenant. Alright? Alright, not now. Hold on. As the months passed, rap music had definitely changed directions. Um, it was I was a, I was never a fan of it, but I couldn't I could tell the difference. Rap acts that talked about politics or harmless fun were quickly faded, had faded away, and gangster rap started dominating. How you feel, man? What's poppin'? What's happening? Not much, man. I know you uh, you put this on Facebook. And I was just trying to tune in and listen. I think I missed most of it, but hey, I just wanted to see if uh, if it was in the silly part of the show. Look. Yeah, man. I'm probably gonna be up here for another hour, hour and a half. But you could go to www.worldstarhitradio. That's okay. worldstarhitradio.com, and you can listen from there. All right. Okay. Cool. Perfect, all right. Bro. I appreciate you. Peace, good brother. Uh -huh. All right. Peace. All right, real quick. Now y'all know I'm gonna run over, run over to ten o'clock. They miles on Black Did I? What's popping, man? Long time no hear from Black Dot. Black Dot, since you just tuned in, I'm talking about the secret meeting that changed hip hop. And of course, y'all already know I started here at World Star Hit Radio. I just decided to do a Facebook kind of post to get people familiar with um, what I what I do up here. All right. Um, Serious Minds needed a platform. The brothers from World Star had a meeting with me and sat down and said, let's make it happen. Let's join brands. Let's join forces. Let's join a, 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 create an alliance with uh, World Star, Hit Radio, and Serious Minds, and let's make things happen. All right, so I'm going to start bringing all those artists up here so we can talk to them face to face. All right, if they could stand the scrutiny of a Professor Griff question, hopefully they can. But anyway, back to the secret meeting. Y'all can call me if y'all want a dialogue. 404-751-5062. All right, that's the number here at World Star. All right, cool. All right, um, where was I at? Only a few months had passed since the meeting, but I suspect that the ideas presented that day had been successfully implemented. Uh, it was as if the order had been given to all major label executives. All right, um, in my book and in Black Dot's work in his book, um, Hip Hop Decoded, we, we, we used to do lectures together, and we already knew at that particular time, the 90 on, they niggerized hip-hop. All right? Hip-hop decoded by Black Dot. All right? Urban culture decoded by Black Dot. We talked 404-751-5062. Call in and let's dialogue. Any questions or comments, just give me a call. But let me finish this. 
uh, the music was climbing the charts, and most companies were, uh, were more than happy to uh, to capitalize on it. Each one of the each one of them were churning out their own very own gangster rap acts, and on an on like an assembly line. Everyone bought into it, consumers included. Violence and drug use became the central theme in most rap music. Um, I spoke to a few of my peers in the industry to get their opinions on the new trend, but was told repeatedly it was all about supply and demand. Sadly, many of them even expressed that the music, the music reinforced the prejudice, uh, um, the prejudice of the minority. All right, so we have to understand something. They niggerized hip hop on purpose. All right, they niggerized one element. Of hip hop, which affected the other three um, elements of hip hop. All right, it was the responsibility of those who had knowledge itself and was guiding hip hop to then, at that point, step in and say, "No, wait a minute, what's going on?" But under social engineering, as it said at the beginning of the article, hold on for a second. Peace. This is Professor Griff here on World Star Hit Radio. The show is Serious Minds. What's good? Hey, it's your brother Black Dot. Black I want Dot. To congratulate you on the show, King. Oh, give thanks, good brother. Really appreciate that, Black Dot. What's going on, man? Man, everything is good, man. I see you constantly moving, spreading that good word. So, uh, I just wanted to holler at you and let you know, uh, Black Dot, you have my support always. Anytime you need me, you already know what it is. Now, Black Dot, you see this screen behind me? What they're doing with this screen, they're pulling anybody I want to interview that's in any any part of the country, they're pulling them up on that screen, and I'll be able to dialogue with you, and we can do the interview. So we're going to line that up, all right? All right, that works. Peace to the family. All right, peace, good brother. Your family good? Everybody's good. We'll talk soon. All right, cool. Peace, man. Peace. Peace. All right. They niggerized hip-hop. By niggerizing and controlling the gateway that artists are coming through to get label deals. Making it profitable for those that own the label. And then once that money was coming in, let me tell you something. I am talking about the secret meeting that changed rap music and destroyed a generation. Music record execs were in cahoots and in bed with those people that invested millions of dollars to build private prisons. Alright? Let me tell you something, man. There were two times in my life that when um, I really took a step back and had to pull back from hip-hop. That was the 90s. Then I jumped back into it. And then, it was recently with the mumble rappers. It just didn't resonate with my soul. The gangster, thugging, balling, pimping, hustling didn't resonate with me. So, in 1994, 95, I was like, no, I'm not doing it. That carried on to 2000 or so, 2001. I jumped back in it. Uh, at that time, I did confrontation camp and uh, a band me and Chuck had. I did the seven octave stuff. The idea was swirling around in my head. Then the rap metal fusion. I was trying to do everything else because I, it wasn't resonating with me. Peace, Stacy Douglas. What's good? I just want y'all to know if anybody want to take an ad out on the show, give me a call directly six seven eight five five seven two nine one nine. All right, let me finish this. He says I officially quit the music industry in music business in 1993 but my heart had already left uh, months before. I broke ties with the major majority of my peers and removed myself from these kind of things that was going on in the music industry and the things that I love. I took some time off, returned to Europe for a few years and settled um, out of state uh, and I lived a quiet life away from the world of entertainment. As the years passed I managed to keep my secret fearful of sharing it uh, with the wrong person, but also a little ashamed of not having had the balls to blow the whistle. But as rap got worse, my guilt grew. 
fortunately in the 90s, in the late 90s, having the internet as a resource which, um, which wasn't at my disposal in the early days made it easier for me to investigate what was going on in what is now labeled as the prison industrial complex. The prison industrial complex. The prison industrial complex. I need y'all to say that to yourself. No, nope, don't say it. Google it. Go look it up. And then we'll start to see the tie and the connection between the music industry in the 90s and the kinds of music that came out. Listen, if you released songs in the 90s, you have made, you will probably fell vic victim to the social engineering because all you did was write to, to quote unquote keep it real, to quote unquote keep it a buck, or to quote unquote speak about what's going on and trying to keep it a hundred. So you wrote about what you was experiencing and what you seen other people experiencing and what you thought was going on. So everybody wanted to be goddamn gangsters. Everybody started taking on gangster names. All right. Everybody wanted to bring bricks and ship loads of drugs in. Did y'all see what y'all were doing to the uh, to a uh, genre of music that we gave birth to? You were actually participating, probably unbeknownst to you on a psychological level. Your ass was niggerizing and criminalizing hip hop. So much so, y'all was putting this music out. Yeah, I'm talking about all y'all that came out in the 90s. And I'm not listening. I love y'all brothers and sisters, man. My wife put her album out in the 90s. So I'm not coming down on anybody. I'm just saying, we got to understand the subject I was dealing with last week, which was mind control and hip hop. And we had to put what Kanye West is going through under the microscope. All right, and what some of these artists are now going through, calling, calling themselves free and independent thinkers, and that kind of thing to do what they want to stop. I'm telling y'all straight up, you don't have your own thoughts. This is social engineering at its best. I told y'all in my book, The Psychological Covert War on Hip Hop, that the Tavistock Institute of Human Relations was involved. All right, um, in brainwashing the masses of these artists. All right, and I told y'all and break and broke it down when I used to do my lectures with Black Dot. All right, um, how it was going down. He said it in his book, and he explained some things in how the industry worked. We it's not only his book, my book, but there's other people that put information out about this particular subject. So we have to understand something. We were warning the people, but it was too much money flowing. Too much money show. The uh, the Black Boys was taking their money, dumping it into artists, uh, buying studios, and, and every time you've seen the video now, it's half-naked chicks and people smoking, spitting at the screen, throwing money, money ain't a thing, money holes and clothes is all a nigga knows. They, these were the kind of things. These are the kind of themes that was going on. Alright? Black Dot said in his book, they take the, uh, the lowest essence of the culture and give it maximum exposure. So all those artists that came out in the 90s got maximum exposure. My wife, Soleil, was smart enough to say, nope, y'all not getting a second album from me because I can't do this anymore. I can't lend my energy, my spirit, my talent to an industry that's destroying the people. Smart move, sis. But how many people have t took the high road? Nope. Some of y'all are still in the game talking about some of the same sad-ass, tired-ass subjects. All right? I love Nas. I love Nas. My daughter had a crush on Nas. <laughs> I ain't mean to say that. But, <laughs> but listen, to give us the positive one mic thing, the other songs you gave us, and then, then to go back and to do the Uchiwali thing and to go back, I'm not picking on Nas. I'm just giving y'all an example how someone that I lent, I lend my energy to, which I was riding for, riding with, you understand what I'm saying? Rooting for the brother. It was like, it was that kind of thing. Not unbeknownst to Nas, it was probably one of those things, he, as an artist, was trying to survive in an industry that wouldn't necessarily accept the positive songs that he was putting out. So most of us say, shit, I can't blame him. He's trying to survive in the industry. And, and, we, and, and we understand that. We truly understand that. So I'm not taking shots at Nas. I probably bought every Nas album. You understand what I'm saying? But we have to understand 
when you find those artists that, that went across the whole entire green during the 90s, most of us had knowledge of the prison industrial complex and what the government was doing to build private prisons and herd black people into the private prisons. Come on, man. Y'all wouldn't listen to us. And I'm one of the ones y'all wouldn't listen to. Straight up. All right? I'm one of the ones that y'all wouldn't listen to. Oh, at the 10 o'clock hour, I was supposed to do a commercial break. <laughs> Let me say this. All right? Of course, y'all yeah, got to call my man and get in touch with his company. Y'all can call me, 678-557-2919. He got some dope Zulu joints. I got the Mansa Musa joint, uh, the Olmec joint, and of course, I got the dope-ish joint. All right? But anyway, give me a shout out. Hit me up. I'll put y'all in touch with him so y'all can get the gear. All right. But my show today is, of course, brought to you by um, Exotic Mixtures. All right. Um, Takia Shaw presents Exotic Naturals. Of course, my man Lion Imagery, my man Solo at Lion Imagery, Khalid Ilakim, the Black History 101 Mobile uh, Museum, my man Vance Vex at Solar Sounds, and of course, Yoga Skills Studio, and of course, my beautiful wife Sole with her company. The Debbie Tribe Wellness. All right, y'all can check me out on IG at Professor Griff, um, uh, Professor Griff uh, on IG. Of course, y'all can check me out on Facebook. That's Facebook forward slash Professor Griff dot me. And of course, join, join on to the Facebook page Serious Minds. All right, um, and of course, on uh, YouTube. Go to the YouTube channel, like, subscribe. I'm putting this conversation that we're having now on YouTube. Tomorrow, if y'all miss it, go to Serious Minds on YouTube. We're talking about the secret meeting that changed rap music and destroyed an entire generation. Today's subject, we're talking about the state of hip-hop. Do not get it twisted. Hip-hop, pardon me, rap is not hip-hop. Hip-hop is not rap. Hip-hop is the umbrella. Rap, I wish they perverted all right, one of the elements, all right, is up under the umbrella of hip hop. The other three elements is, of course, breaking, of course, MCing, and of course, DJing. You should know that, though, if you're in the music industry. You should know that. Tag my brother. You should know that. All right. Anyway, the gentleman went on to say that, um, he put the information out anonymously and out for obvious reasons. He says, my goal is now to get the information out to many people as possible. Please help me spread the word and hopefully others uh, who attended the meeting uh, back in 1991 will be inspired by this to tell their own stories. Most importantly, if one life has been touched by my story, I pray it makes the weight of my guilt a little bit more tolerable. Anonymous. That gentleman put that information out after a private meeting outside on the outskirts of LA. Alright? Secret meeting that changed rap and showed us a connection between a prison industrial uh, prison industrial complex and the music industry as we know it, especially rap music. Alright? Probably didn't do that for gospel, probably didn't do that for jazz. Probably didn't do that for country music. Hip hop was targeted. All right, gangster, thugging, pimping, balling was a low vibratory frequency that uh, that we were riding on at that particular time. All right. When hip hop first originated, everyone thought it was a fad. No one believed it would last, but nobody really took the genre serious. All right. Then, there, then there's the man who some say is the savior of the modern day rap. Who y'all think I'm talking about? Come on. Who y'all think I'm talking about? They say he's the modern day savior of modern rap music. Come on, y'all. Come on. Somebody give me an answer. The number is 404-751-5062. Um, while y'all thinking about that, um, Saturday, June 23rd, myself and Terminator X is doing a history of hip-hop through a revolutionary 
lens, all right? Um, the guest that I invited to come speak on that particular subject is Chub Rock, Minister Server, Jazz from Earwax, DJ Nabs, Jason Orr from the Diary of the Decade, and of course Soleil is going to perform our song Under the Veil, all right? Um, that's Saturday, June 23rd, 4 p.m., all right, at Soul Village, right next door to Moves Music and Little Five Points, uh, 1129 Euclid Avenue, Northeast. For tickets or information, call Professor Griff at 678-557-2919. If you want tickets in advance, because there's more at the door, all right, <laughs> go to www.paypal.me forward slash Professor Griff Corporation, all right? That artist that I'm talking about is Kendrick Lamar, all right? Kendrick Lamar's Grammy-winning album to Pimp a Butterfly discusses problems of today's society and uplifts African Americans. It gives us a sense of hope that everything will be all right. All right. Now, Kendrick Lamar, J. Cole, and probably about two other artists that I can probably name. Yeah. Other than that, everyone else is on the mumble rapping kick. Everyone else is making trauma-based music to, a, to affect trauma-based victims. All right. When does the vicious cycle stop? All right. Social media. It says social media and internet. The internet and in, in a particular uh, in particular the role of the social media has become a uh, irrefutable reflection of the societal development and or uh, undevelopment, I should say. Websites like Tumblr and Facebook were uh, where users can express themselves by, by publishing photos or IG or YouTube or any of these other um, uh, uh, websites uh, where people can just put pictures up and put clips up and broadcast themselves to the world like I'm doing right now. All right? Gave a fresh pursuit of the individual and self-expression. Meanwhile, a person's inability to share these updates with followers or friends suggests that simultaneously, I, um, uh, oh, so, pardon me, simultaneous desires to achieve a sense of community. So basically, what they what they were doing was, since social media hit and people had access, they said, "Well, the hell with the record label. I can just do my songs." And I can speak directly to my audience. But the FBI have admitted that they've established certain Facebook pages. And the FBI and other alphabet boys are trolling social media. All right. All right. To see what trends are, are going on. Because, hell, they got they got fake pages also and they're there. Because that's where we're, what, we're using social media to communicate with one another. All right. Most beefs. Before a minute ago, it was rap battles. We would break, have uh, breaking battles, break dancing, that kind of thing, and that's so how we used to compete. Now most beefs start online and end up spilling offline in some, you know, into some very, very dangerous territory. All right. So underground versus mainstream, then and now, what's the difference? The difference simply because now is the underground is on social media. There's no such thing as underground. Back in the day when I was coming up, a mixtape was actually a mixtape. DJs had to have skills in order to make a mixtape. You thumb through the records and you actually made the tape. Now, mixtape is just a name. Just a name. You pull songs from iTunes. iTunes. And you make a mixtape. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm confused. But that's the era in which we live. It says the rise of the internet age affected one or other critical aspects of hip-hop genre. With social media providing increased visibility for artists, what constitutes a mainstream rapper and the relationship between the artists and the radio stations have changed completely. I don't even listen to the radio anymore. For what? I already know the same 13 songs about to get played over and over and over and over and over. And that fresh new music that I'd want to hear from an artist, I know I'm not going to hear. Alright? If you're just tuning in, this is Serious Minds. Right here on World Star 
Hit Radio, and I'm your host, all right, Professor Griff. They said I could do an hour, but I've only been up here twice, and every single time I went over, I got, I, yeah, I'm, I'm sure wife will understand, but yeah, it's critical. This subject, even when you're talking about hip-hop and the state of hip-hop and what's going on today, even when I talk about certain um, aspects of what's going on today and what's the state uh, what's the state what's the state of hip hop it gets kind of uh, 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 critical in trying to understand actually what is hip hop what is rap is it the same thing and exactly what's going on and who's manipulating and controlling what's going on in uh, a genre of music that we created prior to the rise of social media an artist's sole means of establishing a fan base was to capture the attention of the record label. With only a few major labels in the business, that uh, this reliance on agents con contributed to the uh, streamlined message seen in 90s rap lyrics. Artists don't need agents. If they know how to use sites, SoundCloud, YouTube, Facebook, um, Periscope, uh, IG, Instagram, and, 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 and other social media out, out, uh, outlets, they don't need a manager. They don't need a label. They can get themselves out there like Soldier Boy. But the danger in that, there is no filter. And these people now are allowed to say and do anything, and they don't have to answer to anyone. Unlike when Professor Griff spoke out, these people contacted Chuck D, Public Enemy, managers, producers, and they contacted Def Jam. Def Jam contacted Sony, Columbia, all right, and they contacted them other people, ultimately getting me kicked out of Public Enemy. Now, what, what I said back then, 89, 90, shit, the average dude on YouTube is saying that shit openly. And they're, they're not suffering anything. But my house gets burned down. I get shot at. I get poisoned. Alright? That's the price I had to pay. I get blackballed, whiteballed, a few other goddamn balls in the music industry. Alright? But I suffer for something I warned y'all about years ago. Alright? Anyway, we'll talk about that in a minute. As a matter of fact, I'll put it in the book for everybody to read it. I went through a period of time where I asked you to come challenge me on the information. Nobody stepped up to the plate. Peace, Kimberly Bolton. What's good? So, now, um, the evolution, they say, of rap. But what happened to the evolution of hip-hop? Uh, and any of the artists today interested in having rap, I mean, pardon me, hip-hop, evolve? But it only seems like one uh, element of hip-hop they're focusing in on, and they may be focusing on two. Because nowadays, DJing is big business. And rapping is big business. Not being an MC, but rapping is big business. Graffiti and break dances, break dancing, not so much. Not so much. Even as sites like YouTube allow rappers more freedom in constructing their messages, social media outlets like Twitter and Instagram give listeners an entirely new level of access to their favorite artists. Daily life. <laughs> that is the thing. That gave birth to reality shows. Love and hip-hop. Alright? I'm going to be honest with y'all. I'm not disrespecting any of the people that have participated in the Love and Hip-Hop series. Or whatever. I, I, to be honest with you, I've counted about three people I've ever known that was ever in hip-hop. That was on any of them shows. I'm like... Who are these people and when were they ever in hip hop? I was just confused. So, yeah. So, that's just me, Professor Griff. Some of y'all say, well, you too damn old or you outdated, um, whatever, however y'all want to call it. You a granddad hip hop, a hip hop head, or whatever you, you want to call it. I'm working on basic common sense right now that if a genre of music that we gave birth to 
did so much for so many, how did it end up doing so little for so few right now? You can't compare 90s hip hop stars to today's rappers. Uh, last year, hip hop music experience was yet another generational tug of war. When 19 year old rapper Little Yachty publicly stated that he didn't know five, five songs by neither Tupac or the Notorious B.I.G. See, that hurts my head, man. Coming up in music, I had to know five artists, five artist songs, and the people that wrote the songs and produced the songs. That's just up coming up because back in the day, they actually put credits on the album cover where you could read it. Produced by so-and-so, wrote written by so-and-so, background vocals by so-and-so. And we were engaged because we were into those particular artists. But little, like 19 year old rapper Little Yachty publicly admits that he doesn't know five songs by, by Tupac or the, the Notorious B.I.G. That's embarrassing. I wouldn't tell anybody that. I wouldn't admit that. So, call me if y'all need to talk about it. 404, while I'm here at World Star, the number is 404-751-5062. Alright? Call me. I, when I leave here and you want to talk, because y'all want to make it a little bit more personal, call me. My number is 678-557-2919. The claim was enough to ruffle feathers of, of the purest and older heads alike. Only Yachty, Yachty's word didn't just express his ignorance of music history, but went on to show his disregard for the aesthetics and the groundbreaking work of the 1990s, uh, two of most influential rappers, MCs. On separate occasions, the young rhymer called B.I.G. overrated and stated along with his buddies that Drake was a better rapper than Tupac. Why? Because Drake, Drake can sing. Drake. Uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah. When people like Drake come to mind, I just, I just shift into a whole different vibe, whole different mode. Shout out to Jay Prince doing the mature, responsible adult, older brother, male role model figure thing in the industry by shutting down that beef. Because Drake, you couldn't hold up against Pusha T. Nah. On, online, offline, on stage, off stage. I was at your show, Drake. Yeah. All right. But the question I have for Pusha T, what's with you and Kanye Mess getting together with putting a picture of Whitney Houston uh, eventual deathbed, if I can say that, on the cover? I don't give a flying rat's ass how much money he paid for the photo. That's a no-no, bruh. That's a no-no, dude. We'll talk about that at another time, though. Will you 90 baby shut up and admit rap was 100 times better? Um, it says, will you 90s baby shut up and admit rap was 100 times better in the 90s? What were those women doing in the 90s that gave birth to these artists today? Hold on. The young Yachty's are probably 21 now. The Little Wayne's and the rest of them. There was a period of time where everybody had a little or young attached to their name. That's a whole... See, that's social engineering. There's a time period where everybody drank 40s. That's social engineering. There's a time where people pants were sagging. Social engineering. There's a time when people wear white, wore white tees. Social engineering. I could go over all of these trends in hip-hop and I could show you the social engineering. Were you a part of it? If you're a female rapper in the 90s, were you a bad bitch? If you were a male artist, were you a thug, a gangster? 
a pimp, a hustler? Were you big pimping or small pimping? Hip hop style had nothing to do with fashion. Were you wearing your clothes backwards? Were they sagging? All right, which is a total opposite of what they're doing now. Now they look like some of these cats paint the damn clothes on they so damn tight. Because they niggerized and criminalized the music genre and now they dictate what goes on in the music genre. Or as they say, real talk. Back in the day, if you were a DJ, you had to collect, go buy records and study records. And you had a record collection. Because you was interested in what spawned an entire culture. Alright? Do you remember, I'm talking to the DJs right now. Do y'all remember sample bass songs that came out that was built on that sample? That you could play that stuff today and be like, oh shit, Ray, I remember that joint. Sample bass songs. Songs that was based on samples. I remember that era. So even now when you hear a Biggie song or a Tupac song and you know where that sample came from because you can you know the artist that made the song. Alright? In the late 80s, there was a run on James Brown loops. Oh, we're getting we're guilty for that. Sliding the family stone loops. Uh, we took horns from every place we can get them from. We took James Brown grunt grunts and gospel artists shouting and whatever we did to make the, to make the music, all right? Because it was sample based. Technology companies um, that made the SP twelve hundred, that made the turntables, that made the mixes, that racks fat off of the hip hop, uh, the creation of hip hop, uh, um, the MPC, Roger Lennon, and the rest of them. Um, now with uh, software-based music, all right? Come on, man. Y'all got to give hip-hop its credit. So when you're talking about sample-based songs, Puffy came along and ruined that because he damn near took the whole song. Who, who, who was the cat from the Wu-Tang Clan that, Clan that just rapped over the whole song? He, he rapped over the words and everything. I'm like, God damn. Anyway. Producers wanted to do more. Samples became um, collages. And then the samples were distorted. Bass lines were filtered. And artists began digging. At one point, a major hip-hop crew was even called D-I-T-C. What does that stand for, y'all? That's right, digging in the crates. Searching for records to use as sample sources became the way to the future. To, uh, the wave of the future. The creative direction of a genre and cast off shackles of the J.B. James Brown breakbeats. Q-Tip sampled Roy Ayers, Large Professor sampled Donald Byrd, and the music of R&B, jazz, and soul musicians again filled the airways. He was beautiful. Peace, Crystal, what's good with you? Alright? Freestyle, back in the days, I'm talking to the young artists now, and I'm talking to your producers, and your engineers and your managers that's man managing these artists that don't know their history. the hip-hop history. Freestyle meant freestyle. Not you, mem you memorize something you wrote and then you spitting it. No, that's not freestyling. Freestyle actually meant freestyling. Alright, let's understand that particular dynamic. The craft of rap once required, yes required, multi-dimensional varied abilities. Not to hop on the art of the MC here, but let's think briefly about freestyling. Gone are the days when one could lob five, uh, five words chosen at, a, uh, at any random time into the air for a mic-wielding poet to transform into an off-the-cuff narrative. Who did I see do that, man? Uh, what's the brother name? Supernatural. Y'all got to go on YouTube and see this brother, man, Supernatural. This brother does a show where anybody in the audience can give him a word and he's off the top of the dome freestyling. Ah, for real. But anyway, where was I at? When the movie 8 Mile came, exposed battle rap to the masses, the tide was already uh, turning the film 
uh, completely flipped the free-flowing contest into a theater for pre-written punchlines. But anyway, that was the battle. That was the battle film movie that was out that turned a lot of these cats into battle rhymers and uh, battle MCs and battle rappers. Alright? It was flat out unacceptable that you had written lyrics. So much so that cats do shows now and they rap over their own lyrics. You would get the mic taken from you back in the day. Not good. Not good. Alright? Like I said before, mixtapes were actually mixtapes. Alright? The term mixtapes have become an oxymoron in the in the uh, rapid share era. Alright? So much so. So much so that everything is moving quick. And mixtape now is just a name. Cab drivers and barbershops set set themselves apart from the competition by com, com, pardon me, keeping exclusive rap tapes in heavy rotation, cultivating a select clientele. Black Dot will tell you about the actual rap tape. One tape left the Bronx. Them tapes were passed around and duplicated. You had to get your hands on a tape. Now for the next few minutes, we're going to talk about how we went through what gave birth to hip hop sick late 60s early 70s as Chuck D in his book Chuck D presents this day in rap and hip hop history all right 73 to 83 in his introduction 73 to 83 is the incubation period all right he gives credence and credit to all those poets that stood out on the corner spitting the poetry how did rap get taken over? We talked about the uh, the secret meeting that changed rap music and destroyed a generation. How did it get to where it is today? Is the question that we need to ask. All right, Sabir so Bay, peace, man. What's good with you, bro? Miss Fenton, what's happening? How did it get to where we are today? How did a Dr. Dre commercial come out? All right. And they about Dre Beats headphones and they're hiding images. How did Beyonce and Jay-Z end up doing monumental work and they're hiding certain images in the videos to corrupt and, and, and uh, pollute um, the music even further? Alright? How did we get to the point where now we're seeing Eminem taken to the stage and in this climate, in this climate, of mass shootings, why would Eminem pyrotechnics let off fire shots and bullet shots and which sounds like explosions and bullets at a concert? Uh, just probably a dope concept, but bad timing. This is what we held responsible for. And we have to understand and keep this and, and, and be real about what we're dealing with, alright? All right, let's just be real about it. Why is Beyonce and Jay-Z at this particular point in both of their careers having to take nude flicks? Where are we at in, where are we at in music that we feel we have to do that? But the question is, why the fuck are y'all so concerned about it? Excuse my French. If that's the two married couple doing what they want to do in their own bedroom, their own $88 million mansion. Yeah, why is that news, though, is, is my question. We went so far into establishing what we established, as Chuck D writes, to got, getting to the point where we here now and we're minding other people's business on pictures that they put up. Why are we at the point now where one of the brothers from 21 Savage uh, pulling out guns and barbecues and picnics and pool parties. If they've learned nothing from the brothers and sisters that went through the 90s and in that era, they should have learned that. That's just not cool, not good. You should have learned that. Alright? A lot of us went to jail and went through that era. Alright? Where 
Y'all should have learned that lesson and y'all don't have to suffer from that. Alright? Why are we getting to the point now where those people that have the cash money and that are millionaires and got the Maybachs and Maybach records and all this kind of stuff with the money uh, still not doing right by the artists when we went through that history. We should have learned from that. And that's just real. So I'm reading that Little Wayne is, got, get, is getting released in time enough to do um, the remake of one of his older albums, but um, walking away with $10 million. All right? I saw the cover of Man Nicki Minaj's new project. The question is, very artsy. I'm an I'm a artist myself, so I can respect the art. All right? What are the themes and the theme songs and the themes and the messages being sent to young people that's supporting that particular artistry? All right? Some of y'all say, well, your old ass shouldn't be the judge. All right? That's why I'm doing this body of work um, here on social media so we can actually have that discussion. And by the way, the phone number is 404-751-5062. Call, let's talk about it. Alright? Um, this whole idea of Meek Mills being a political prisoner. Who are y'all that are writing these articles? I'm sure Meek Mills is not calling himself a political prisoner. Who are y'all that are writing these articles that's making young people think that what Meek Mills has went through and it is going now going through constitute him as a political prisoner? Nah. Leonard Peltier is a political prisoner. Alright? All those brothers and sisters from the Black Panther Party that fought, bled, and died. Alright? That helped establish who and what we are today as public enemy and other organizations. No, those are political prisoners. Mumia Abu Jamal, Jamil Alameen, Matulu Shakur, other people that I can mention. Those are political prisoners. I don't understand what Mick Mills was doing politically before he got into this trouble. So how does that make him a political prisoner? Alright. He shed light on what he's going through, which is a valuable lesson for those of us that have to pass that information down to younger people. But, nah. Uh, little Kim, I love you, sis. Stop, though, for real. Stop. What, what do I mean by that? The, the, the stop sign. Stop. Just stop. S-T-O-P. Stop taking other people's problems on. Whatever. Leave it alone. Seriously. I loved you better when you were Little Kim. Off the block, Little Kim. Alright? I know Little Kim might watch this and say, well, shit, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> and that's real. And, and I, can, I can respect that. And I, and I got you. doing this to create this platform to present books have a, a, a very up to date current talk all right, to introduce a body of work that may get by you those of us that, that still read and still study those of us that are responsible for young people those producers and managers that are responsible for those artists like Migos and other artists that are out there that y'all know y'all need to sit them down um, with the Professor Griffs of the world to sit them down and say, listen, man, sooner or later you're about to do an interview, you got to get educated on this musical genre. All right? So come on, y'all. Let's step this game up. All right? But um, my upcoming shows, I want to talk about the Secret Covenant. All right? I want to talk about the 21 goals of the Illuminati all right, and how they affect us today. Since y'all have written the Illuminati off as being fictitious and fake, then that should, this next conversation shouldn't bother y'all then. I want to be able to bring Sophia Stewart on the show and let her talk to us about the entertainment industry and how it treated her um, and how they took her material. All right, shout out to Sophia Stewart. All right. Um, 
I want to be able to go out with a camera and a crew and go talk to some of them people since they won't come to us here at World Star. I want to be able to go to them and have the conversation with what's going on in the music industry or just the entertainment industry as a whole. Alright? Um, I think this is a beautiful way to get this particular job done. Alright? Alright, the brother's company that did the shirt and the hat, um, athletics.com. It's www.afr-letics.com. Alright? Go see the brother, man. Support the brother. Alright? This is some serious gear. Good quality, too, y'all. For real. I'm sporting a Zulu. I'm sporting a Zulu t-shirt and my dope-ish hat because... Just like Nicki Minaj and Little Kim and other people can put out the images they put out, we gotta start embracing those companies that start that that put out more positive images. All right, and I want to be a living example of that. All right. As we bring this talk to a close, all right, y'all need to get the number etched in your mind and your brain so y'all can start calling so we can dialogue. Four zero four seven five one five zero. Six to this Professor Griff here at Serious Minds for World Star Hit Radio. All right. If y'all have any questions or any comments, y'all can email me at seriousmindsinfo at gmail.com. Any shows y'all like to do, anybody y'all feel I should interview, just give me a call and we can definitely make it happen. Any show suggestions, let's make it happen. All right. Today we talked about the state of hip hop, we talked about the secret. Um, letter that destroyed uh, a generation in hip-hop, all right? The secret letter that niggerized and criminalized hip-hop because we discussed today private prison industrial complex, prison industrial complex in bed with the music industry, all right? All right, if you have any books that you want me to shout out or present, if you have any um, ads that you want to put here on Serious Minds at World Star Hit Radio, Get in touch with me. I'll send you a pricing sheet all right, for the ads. And let's talk, man. Uh, I want to be able to dedicate aspects of my show to build young entrepreneurs. I don't care if you got clothing line, a clothing line. I don't care if you got um, an album you try to push, a CD, or whatever it is. Give me a call at 678-557-2919. Once again, shout out to athletics.com. It's www.afr.com. Uh, dash L E T I C S dot com. You can find them on IG at at Athletics on Facebook Athletics, Twitter Athletics. All right, go see the brother, brother. And of course, uh, my daughter's company, Exotic Mixtures, uh, where you can get exotic naturals. All right, go check out Kiki on IG. Check her out on on Instagram. Check her out on Facebook. All right. And of course, my man Khaled El Akin with the Black History 101 Mobile Museum. All right. Check out Solar Sound Studio, my man Vance Vex right here in the ATL. Check out Yoga Skills Studio. If you're into yoga, um, with, um, um, Kia is bringing some other programs there, whether it's karate, whether it's study groups or whatever. Check them out. Look them up. Yoga Skills Studio. All right. Check out the Soul Yoga Fest that's coming up. Chicago, Atlanta, Jamaica, and a few other places. All right, and of course, my beautiful wife, Soleil, with uh, the Debbie Tribe Wellness. All right. All right, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, that's all I got for today. I don't want to talk y'all um, to death. Check me out on uh, YouTube at Serious Minds. S-I-R-I-U-S-M-I-N-D-Z on YouTube. All right, Facebook, that's, forward, that's Facebook forward slash Professor Griff dot me. Alright, and of course, um, check me out. And y'all got to sign on so I can get y'all the information um, at www.professorgriff.me. And of course, go to Facebook and join on to the study group we have on Facebook. Alright, this is Professor Griff. I want to thank everybody on Faith this Facebook Live. Um, I didn't mean to do Facebook Live this long. But anyway, we're getting people acclimated to me being on Wednesday nights from 9 to I guess... 10, 30, 11. Damn, it's 10, 41. All right? I love you all the life, man. This is Professor Griff for Serious Minds. Of course, Serious Minds for Serious Minds that attract Serious Minds. Seriously. 
All right, revolution is not an event. It's a process. And this is Professor Griff. I love y'all to life, not to death, but to life. I'll see y'all on June, Saturday, June 23rd, me and Terminator X at 4 o'clock at Soul Village. All right, uh, for the history of hip hop. Give me a call if y'all want tickets. All right, if y'all call me and say y'all saw this show, I'll give y'all a discount on the tickets. Hit me up, 678-557-2919. Peace, man. This is Professor Griff, and I'm Audi 5. Jeez. Peace, y'all. Greetings. This is Professor Griff of Public Enemy. Welcome to the Oculus Inc. The Oculus. They are the ultra-secret society. They are the ones that manipulate and control your perception. They're actually the gatekeepers of your perception. The Oculus are the ones that actually write the prescription. They are the ones to determine who and why you're seeing what you're actually seeing through signs and symbols. These signs and symbols, we see them every single day. Your banks, your fast food stores, energy companies, gas stations, car companies, sports teams, all of them have signs and symbols that they use in such a way where they speak a language to one another. These are the things that the Oculus controls. The Oculus. Oculus Inc. The hottest music. R&B. Hip hop pop. I still can't Reggae. EDM. Indie. Old school.